In 2020, The Morning Brew was acquired for $75 million, a precipitous climb for the company that just five years earlier was started out of a University of Michigan dorm room. Two years later, they are on pace for $75 million in annual revenue. And in this conversation with CEO Austin Reef, we talk about the metrics that matter to a company like The Morning Brew, what he's learned about hiring, scaling a company, and how they've implemented the EOS model to get outstanding results. Stay with us. You had a very interesting tweet recently. There is no industry in the world that is easier to get to an eight-figure exit than digital media. But there's also no industry harder to get to a 10-figure valuation than digital media. Can you explain uh, what that means in more detail and maybe what you're experiencing that made that pain so, or that realization so clear? Yeah, so when everyone starts, whenever anyone starts off a, a question with, you tweeted recently, my heart drops. I'm like, oh no, like what, what are you going to bring up? But no, this is a, a good one. I have, I have a lot of conviction in this. So first off, let's define digital media. I'm not really referring to Netflix or anything like that, right? I'm talking about digital publishing, right? The the BuzzFeed Vox, Morning Brews, all, all, all these, these companies that grew up over the course of 10 or 15 years. And I think the challenge with most of these companies is you... Well, the pro, right? Well, why is it easy to get to eight figures of, of, of revenue or, or maybe even eight figures of profit? It's really inexpensive to create content, right? Uh, you know, creating a tweet costs nothing. Creating video content, we're creating video content and audio content now. It's costing us uh, whatever Riverside costs. So, uh, you know, very, very, very inexpensive. So creating content, inexpensive. Distributing content, very inexpensive, right? You have these platforms, and if you can find fit on a platform before they change an algorithm, you can build a, a great audience on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or, or YouTube. And so it's really inexpensive and allows you to test and iterate and get your voice out there and create a brand. We did it over newsletters, other people done it on YouTube, on podcasting. And so that's why it's actually not that hard to build an audience and then sell uh, sell that audience or sell to that audience. The reason why it's so hard to create, let's call it a billion dollar company, is because the shelf life of content is like three seconds, right? I create a tweet that, that content's good for a very short period of time. We create a newsletter. That newsletter is good for what? A day maybe? And so you with a digital publisher, you're amortizing this content over the course of minutes or hours versus Netflix, uh, which is another media company, right? They create uh, squid games and people watch that for years and years and, and maybe decades, right? And so you can spend so much more money on content. You can invest in it, right? And therefore, you can amortize that content over a longer period of time. But when you're a digital publisher creating news or or even evergreen content, like it's really the, the, the value is not there uh, and so it is very difficult over time to build uh, a, a multi-billion dollar brand in media. Not to say it can't be done. There are people doing it, but it's incredibly difficult uh, versus software, again, has very different economics. Software is economic similar to Netflix. You create software, it's good forever or, or close to forever, and you can amortize that over you know, many customers in a long period of time. And, you know, akin to, you know, a recent tweet, there's a lot of noise in Twitter, but there is also signal if you're paying attention to and listening to the right people. And so the reason that that, you know, put an antenna up for me is this is high signal because you are the CEO of one of the flagship Vanguard digital media upstarts that's pointed to as being, you know, blue chip frontline as it pertains to growth and what's accomplished. So it's, it's particularly clear, uh, uh, you know, interesting when you're the one kind of waving that flag and not, you know, some VC that got wrecked because they got into Buzzfeed or Vice or something. Yeah. I, I mean, look, right. I, I am talking my book a little bit. We didn't raise capital and, and, and so, uh, and I don't believe media companies should raise capital or, or not a lot of capital, especially not venture capital. Uh, so yeah, I think it's incredibly difficult to, to do. I mean, it's hard to make a billion dollar company or, or, or create one anyways, uh, but particularly in media. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, it is hard. And, and, you know, if I build a $999 million company, I'll, I'll be happy. So I'll be okay with that. 
I think understanding the potential of what you're building is incredibly important. What we've seen in the last couple of years, so many people, right, have raised if their company can be worth 10, 20, 50 billion. And it just, they've, they've turned themselves into a bit of a zombie. So talk to me about where Morning Brew stands now. Uh, you know, people that are, that, that are paying attention, they know that there was a majority acquisition of the firm by Business Insider. Um, but, but talk to us about, I, I looked at LinkedIn, it looked like there's over 300 people working at your company now. Yeah, so Morning Brew was majority acquired, you know, technically by Axel Springer. Axel Springer owns uh, Insider and a bunch of other. They just bought Politico. Uh, it's a very large German media and holding company. And that deal happened end of 2020. Since then, we've really taken off from really every metric. So we've gone from about 50 employees to about 300. Revenue went from 20 million to 70 million or so. Profitability's increased, and so we've really. Uh, just grown a ton since then across not just newsletters. So after we launched Morning Brew, we launched you know, the Morning Brew for X, for X industry or X job function, Marketing Brew, Retail Brew, HR, Healthcare Brew launched today. If anyone listening or watching this works in any of these industries, definitely go sign up. They really are great uh, publications. And so that's where we, we went next. And now we're starting to expand beyond that into multimedia content, audio, video content, as well as other revenue streams. So we've built an education team, which is our first foray into direct to consumer revenue. And so one of the you know elements here when it pertains to multimedia, I have so many questions. You gave me like three different pathways to go down. So I'm actually gonna reel it back in and go to specifically one associated with the acquisition. That yeah. rate of growth and the increase of uh, employees and, and all these other things, can you break down part of what was unlocked or enabled as a part of the acquisition? Was it, you know, was it cross promotion between these other brands? Was it access to existing, you know, sales infrastructure? Like how do you conceptualize? you know, the before and after of Morning Brew's operations after that uh, majority acquisition occurred? Yeah, so it was actually none of that, right? It wasn't synergy with any other company, but it was access to capital. So we've been bootstrapped for so long. And what Axel Springer gave us the ability to do, number one, it gave us a little bit of secu job security for people we hired. So people were more willing to come to Morning Brew if we had the backing of Axel Springer. And number two, it allowed us to be a little bit riskier because you know, Axel Springer wasn't going to let Morning Brew go out of business. And so we were able to ramp up investment a little bit faster than if we would have otherwise if we didn't have a, an owner. And so we were able to invest more than historically we would have because you know we didn't want to, your cash was a concern. When you're owned by a $10 billion company, cash becomes less of a concern uh, because of the infrastructure around you. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. I want to build back up to the multimedia and like Morning Brew is a really interesting thing that, you know, the Morning Brew could potentially now be a brand that someone interfaces with and they don't think of you guys as a newsletter company, which literally like I remember getting the newsletter, I, I'm going to guess like 2018 or 2019 for the first time. And it's like, wow, this is so cool, but so distinct. It's crazy that like it's, it's even possible now that someone might see it as like Dan on TikTok or, you know, some educational YouTube video. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Right. So I think there's pros and cons to that, right? A lot of companies out there, a lot of media companies have decided to build a branded house. Every, you know, Morning Brew this, Morning Brew that. Uh, a lot have. And I, I think the challenge is it's really hard to be all things to all people. And we have subsets of our audience that like to get personal finance content in a really funny tone from Katie, right? Or like to get comedy TikToks from Dan or want to hear about entrepreneurship from my co-founder Alex and Sophia and Jesse Puji over at The Crazy Ones, which is a new show they launched. But we want to be careful about preserving Morning Brew's voice and Morning Brew's uh, essence, right? And so while everything within all these other brands, they do ladder up, they have the same ethos, they have the, so, the same uh, voice, they, they are portrayed in different ways, right? And so uh, yeah, you totally could stumble upon money with Katie or the crazy ones. And, and at first not even know it's a part of morning brew. And that's a great thing for us. We view that as opportunity. It allows us to be more flexible, more nimble, allows us to test things, uh, with less, uh, risk. And so, 
yeah, we, we, we're, we're excited about that, the, the house of brands approach. And it's interesting that you still talk about voice because from the earliest days when it was really understood as kind of a singular newsletter company, I remember, you know, you and Alex both talking about that as like the style guide and the, what, a, what reading a morning brew newsletter should, what that experience should be. Um, I want to, I want to talk about some of the new multimedia properties, but first going back to those early days, there's a simplicity to the early days of a business where there's only a couple metrics that matter, obviously cash in the bank and revenue, but specific to a newsletter business, was it really, you know, new subscribers, signups and open rate? Like what were the metrics that mattered to you operationally at that point in time? Yeah. At the beginning of the company, we had three goals, right? The best possible newsletter on the planet, grow that newsletter with high quality subscribers, and then sell ads into that newsletter to support the growth of the writing team to hire more writers so we could get even better and support the growth of the newsletters. We could grow with more high quality subscribers. That was the flywheel for two or three years straight. We didn't think about anything else, right? Grow, sell, right? Grow, sell. And what we did was we, I think a lot of newsletter companies just focused on newsletters, but we focused on opens. We were really, really hyper-focused on opens. It's a little bit more tricky to do that now because of uh, Apple's new updates But five years ago, that's all we cared about. And so every single day at 11 a.m., we'd stop what we were doing and we'd check the open rate of the newsletter and we'd write it on a whiteboard. And we had just months and months and months of open rates every single day. And that was our North Star. And that's where we were most focused as a company. And everything that went into that was something that mattered. A-B testing subject lines, acquiring high quality subscribers, writing a great newsletter. And you know, the, the five, six, seven, 10 people who worked at the company at the time, our entire lives revolved around that number at 11 a.m. every single day. And, and so now as uh, a firm that is you know, an order of magnitude larger, how do you instigate that same degree of focus on a team by team basis? Because just the quantity of metrics that have to matter when you're at this scale, has to, it also grows by an order of magnitude. How do you instigate that, but also stay kind of abreast of all these different teams as the CEO? Yeah. So what's interesting is now, Morning Brew's multi-product, right? Multi-mediums, multi-revenue stream. So to your point, many different metrics matter. And so what we do at Morning Brew is we use this this approach called traction. I don't know if you've read it. It's a I think the author's name's Gino Wickham or something. Gino like Wickman, that. yeah. Wickman. Yeah. yeah, It's a great book. And so we have company rocks, right? Those are the the companies, three to seven top goals for, for the next 90 days. Each one on each person on leadership has their goals, their three to seven goals. And we start to layer them down at the company. And so now we don't, uh, and I think it's a little unfortunate, but just the way our business is right. We can't have a metric like the New York times, which is like 15 million subscribers. And that's the North star for us. There's a variety of metrics because we are multi-revenue stream, multiple multiple uh, businesses. Uh, and so those metrics might change every year, every quarter. This quarter, we're really focused on growing this property. This year, we're really focused on monetizing this property. And what's really important is the company understands what are the three to seven most important things for the whole company. And then each leader to understand what is their priority. Are their priorities uh, helping us get to this quarter's goals or are they setting ourselves up for next quarter's goal or next year's goal? And it's a little bit more complex. It's like a little bit of a web that takes way more preparation than simply saying, right, grow, sell one newsletter. And it's definitely one where, you know, that book coaches you towards starting at the top. So really starting in the clouds, 10 years out, three years out, what do you want? What are you trying to attain? And to some degree, it doesn't perfectly then lay out what the micro goals are, but it, it allows you to actually at least trim the fat of the things that maybe were potentially t- stealing some of your focus that are no longer relevant. How have you constructed or if, are you comfortable sharing what those really big you know, vision and goals are for Morning Brew over those time horizons? Yeah. So what's interesting is that that number has changed every, every time, right? My original goal was I mean, day one of Morning Brew, before I even knew what traction was, my goal was like, how do I make enough money so I can do this for a living so I don't have to go get my job in finance? And then once we accomplished that, I was like, how do we get to uh, $10 million of revenue? Like, that would be crazy. 
And then it was like, wow, can we get to 25 million of revenue? And even a year ago, we were at 46 million. We're like, you know, we get to, we get to hundred million dollars of revenue. That would be amazing in three years. Right. And we're sitting here today at $70 million of revenue uh, this year or so. And for us, it's, it, it, it's now how do we get to 250 of revenue, right? And now it's like, how do we get to $100 million of profit, right? For me, if as a media company, a digital media company, we get to $100 million of profit, that's more of a 10-year vision, I believe, right? I, I think that would be that would be incredible. And so, I, I mean, in, in the vein of Morning Brew, we've always cared about profitability. And so revenue goals are nice, right? They're easier to look at. They're easier to, to think through, Uh Right. But ultimately, I think, you know, the 10 year goal could be 100 million is 100 million dollars of profit uh, in my mind, at least that would be, you know, 100 million dollars of profit in 20. What is that? 2032 or whatever it would be would be pretty crazy. Yeah. Hopefully just inflation hasn't gone crazy by then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so so all of this really builds up to, to one of the core questions that I wanted to ask you, which is you if you look at the statistics around entrepreneurship and, and on, the success of entrepreneurial ventures, counterintuitively, if you watch, you know, like the social network or somewhat something, it's not actually 20 year olds that have the highest probability of success and the best outcomes when it comes to a venture. It's usually a second time founder. It's usually someone in their forties, maybe their fifties. And so you and Alex are really substantial outliers, not just in the realm of digital media, but as entrepreneurs who founded companies in their twenties generally. So my question for you is really the attainment of knowledge beyond. So, so you, you're imagining yourself starting, hey, can we you know, make enough money so that I don't have to go you know, work in finance? That's a huge gap between executing at, you know, the operations of a firm that is um, on its way to $100 million in revenue. The actual collection of the knowledge that you needed, were you you know, hiring coaches, hiring consultants, obviously you're reading books, but like, what did you do to fast track the knowledge attainment? There's a little bit of sur survivorship bias here, right? Which is to say that I agree, you know, it, to some extent that we, we learned a lot. We worked really hard, but also let's, let, you know, just to be transparent, we got lucky, right? We, we luckily stumbled upon newsletters. Now we took advantage of that, right? And I think that's your question. How do we do that? I think it's a few things. I think one, now, of course, I have a business coach and I have a great network of people. But in the early days, it was just we were so fully immersed in what we did. Every single minute of my life that I wasn't sleeping, I was reading a book on growth marketing because how, how are we going to grow the newsletter? It was spending time talking to people who sell ads. It was going to industry events, although not too many, to be honest. Um, I don't think there's that much value, but going to there when we saw value and just working. And we, you know, I, I really believed uh, if we just outworked everyone, it wasn't, okay, if we outwork everyone, it'll be a $100 million company. It was if we outworked everyone, we can just do 2% better or 5% better. And I think in some ways, us having a beginner mindset and learning as we go, as, as we went, was really valuable. However, we did, and we still do, make a lot of mistakes. And so, again, you're right. We are the outliers. I also invest on the side, and I don't usually invest in founders my age or, or when I started Morning Brew because there is such a steep learning curve. And the last thing to, to add on to that is also, you have to remember, it was a bootstrap business. There was no investor expectation. If we would have raised two, five, ten million million, $10 million, and the investor expectation was to grow at a certain rate every year, uh, I think we would have failed miserably. I think we set our own goals, our own expectations, because we didn't have outside capital. And that was really, really important for us to keep expectations at the right level. Got it. But you have the coach now. So can you talk about like when the realization was that maybe it's just enough money's coming in the door that I can afford it, but there's also a degree to which it's like, hey, I now at least have a conception of what I might not know and need to access this, this thing that will increase... You know, speaking from my own experience, I just hired uh, my first coach for my agency, and it's like already three sessions in. Wow, I'm just seeing the board a little bit more clearly than I previously had, and I was super skeptical before I had actually hired a coach. Yeah, I mean, look, they say uh, everyone has a plan to get punched in the mouth, right? And I got punched in the mouth a bunch of times. I thought I made the right decision. It was a horrible decision. I you know, you, you make enough decisions where you have so much conviction, and you you couldn't be more wrong. 
you're so wrong. And it's like, holy shit, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like I'm getting punched in the mouth every single day at work and I need an outsider's perspective. And that happened, you know, 2019, once we went from single newsletter to multi-newsletter and we were scaling the company and, you know, the company had to be 20, 30, 40 people. I was like, wow, I am just getting crushed. Like big decisions. I am just, you know, I'm consistently, you know, a CEO or executives, they get paid and they have their jobs to make very few decisions a day or a week and have a very high percent uh, hit rate on those decisions. Be right 80% of the time, 85%. I was right like 50%, 60%, right? And it wasn't good enough. And so seeing a coach and being more introspective and, and rethinking things was what I had to do or we were going to fail miserably. And so I saw that I started seeing a coach and I've seen multiple coaches now and I just grew some humility uh, because, again, you should get punched in the face a bunch of times and you realize that, you know, just because you got here doesn't mean you're going to be able to get to the next level. Are there any of those decisions that you have enough distance from now that you can share? I mean, most of them, honestly, were hiring, right? Most of them were like, oh, we need this role. I want to hire that person. And you hire that person like, oh, my God, like that person is, is like not right for this role. Like, what was I thinking? Why do I think we need someone that's senior? Why did I think I needed someone with, uh, you know, with that background? And, and you just get punched in the, the, the face with these hiring decisions. And the problem with these decisions are they're so, they're so costly, right? When you miss on a senior hire, it's so painful because you spend three to five, you spend two months really, or a month really understanding, do I need this person? Then you spend two, three, four months hiring them. Then you have to wait a month for them to leave their job to come. Then it takes three to six months to realize it's not the right person. And then a month to three months to get rid of them. So you're 12, 15, 18 months in and you're like, wow, we just wasted 15 to 18 months in this part of the business. Like what a disaster. Uh, that's the big one. The other one was expectation setting, right? I, it, it, it might be a little unfair but to myself. But in the early days, I started this this business with Alex and there was a bunch of other, you know, uh, people around and we didn't have the expectation, right? A bunch of other great employees, some some people our age, and we didn't have the expectation that this company was going to be as big as it was. And I, and I think if we would have been more ambitious mentally, right? Thought, thought it was be bigger. Maybe we would have set more expectations with the team. Like, hey, this team may evolve, may have to hire more senior people. And I think I've learned, you know, from the early days that like you really have to set expectations to all your coworkers to make sure they understand that like, yes, uh, this is the way things are now, but things can always change. We might always need, we might need more uh, management. We might need to move people around and take new roles. And I think uh, I wasn't being thoughtful enough when I hired someone or I made a decision. And so I wasn't setting the right expectations with that person and say, hey, this is where it is now, but maybe it'll be somewhere different later. Uh, and so those two of setting expectations right from day one with new people and then also uh, hiring the right people. In the vein of hiring, going from bad to good hires, can you talk about some of the, uh, you know, maybe 10x isn't the right term, but super high leverage hires that you've made? Because it is digital media. There is an ability to, you know, scale infinitely as it pertains to distribution, create at a very low cost. Um, you, you hear this sometimes in tech, the 10x engineer that just like fixes or covers for everyone's problems. But in the content business, in the media business, you can uncover those same type of talents. Who have been some of the you know highest leverage team members on the Morning Brew, either shout out by name or specifically by role, that just allow you to take the next step as a company? The highest leverage people recently, right? In the early days, everyone was high, high leverage, right? And of course, our managing editor, Neil Freiman, is incredibly high leverage. You know, so much of what we do today is based off his tone and his voice. So someone like that, of course, you can't even uh, make a comparison or, 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 or go beyond that. But let's talk more recently. It's really the executive you hire a COO, we now have a publisher, a head of product, people like that, who the team was like kind of shaky and you bring them in and they're so good at their job that I never need to think about that team. It's a really big focus for the whole company. How is that team navigating? What is that team doing, right? So let's take an, I'll use a specific example. We had a B2B business. Uh, uh, it was retail brew, it was emerging tech brew, we were launching marketing brew. 
And that was like the focus, the entire company was getting those out the door, fixing those. And then we hired someone named Jacob uh, who took over the B2B business. He was GM of B2B. And all of a sudden, the focus of the entire company, one person was owning that and he was taking over the whole thing. And that allowed everyone else to be like, okay, that guy has that thing. We can now focus on something else and optimize other things. And so people who can turn your, your weaknesses or growth opportunities into like, oh, never need to think about those again because that person is doing such a great job. That's a huge unlock for the rest of the organization. It's a huge weight lifted off everyone else's shoulders. And when you're thinking about your company as a system and how it interacts with one another, that now becomes this lens where you're identifying the constraint, you're identifying the choke point, and then hopefully being able to recruit effectively enough to find someone who can fill the gap. Really, I'm, of course, I'm the CEO of the company, but each executive oversees a team of between, let's call it 15 and 50 or 75 people. And so they're really the CEOs of their own business. And when those businesses can hum and work in a really great way and then interact with other systems, right? Other teams, that's really when you have uh, uh, a really efficient operation. Got it. So going back, we, we talked about the early days when, you know, it's just a, a half dozen people or so, and we're just worried about, you know, open rates and, and new subscribers and that three piece flywheel that you mentioned. Um, there is to, to some degree, uh, maybe a lower threshold. You don't want to mess up necessarily like, you know, an advertising, you know, spot or something, but if an error is made or we need to, you know, experiment with this one newsletter, there's tomorrow's newsletter and, and we'll kind of be okay. Maybe that wasn't the mindset that you had, but I would, I guesstimate when you're small, there is a little bit, you know, freedom or freewheelingness to how that media gets produced. Is that fair? Yeah, totally. So now that you're at this scale, how do you think about the experiments? Like there's like, you know, the market research tested bets, opportunities. I'm sure like, you know, it's, it's very, pretty straightforward. Hey, healthcare is this like huge business vertical. We don't have something there. Like we need to figure out a way to attack it. But then there's also like the comedic TikTok sketch that is very, you know, like experimental, maybe it'll land, maybe it won't, and has a different type of investment. So how do you think about the different experiments that the morning brew runs and how to effectively size those bets. Yeah. It's understanding what is the opportunity if we succeed. Always start with, if we succeed, how big is the opportunity? Is it quantified in the thousands, the millions, the tens of millions, right? What investment do we need to get there over what time period? And what is the minimum viable test, right? What's the, how can we build an MVP and test as fast as possible? Right. With someone like Dan and his TikToks, we had to hire Dan. And it wasn't that big of a bet from a monetary perspective. It turned out to be an amazing bet. I'm glad we did it. But it didn't have to be a big bet. But if you told me, hey, we're going to build a software company that's going to do X, Y, and Z, and we need to hire 50 people, and you know, that's $5 million of annual payroll, the opportunity needs to be quantified in the you know tens and tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions, to make that worthwhile. So how big is the opportunity? How big is the investment? And how much work and distraction is it going to take to get us there? Amen. Um, how have the packages that you've um, sold to your different sponsor partners, you know, it started with the, the banner at the top of the newsletter. How have those evolved as you've learned more about ad sales, actually built out that team within Morning Brew? We really think we have a, we have a really compelling ad unit, which is a native ad unit written in our tone. So the basic ethos that the ad unit has not changed, but the way we, where we put it, we've done a ton of testing. We test everything in our ad units. And so the number of ad units has changed, right? So we do small modifications, but one of the reasons why we were successful was because we found the perfect fit of content, medium, and ad unit. And that is what makes newsletters so successful is when you write that ad unit in that tone, so we haven't done too much evolution of the unit itself. Now our packages have gotten much bigger. We do events and we do, you know, so you can sponsor our events. We do virtual events. We do content on our site. We do podcasts. So when we work with a big brand, we want to, we're not selling products. We're selling our audience, right? It's, it's here's how you get in front of our audience. Here's how you get in front of it. Then on Instagram, on TikTok, on, on YouTube, newsletters, events, everything, right? And that's our goal is to work deeply with a partner to engage them with our audience in our tone, our voice, our style across as many mediums as frequently as possible. And have you had to evolve the archetype of who you're speaking to with that morning brew voice? Because I also remember in the early days, it was like, 
I have this experience as, you know, someone in school or recently out of school who's just trying to access these business stories in, in, in a way that makes sense to me and isn't kind of written like the Wall Street Journal, uh, so to speak. But, you know, as the audience grows, like, is that still how you define the voice or how has that had to evolve? Yeah, I, I think naturally as we've aged and our writers have aged, the, the audience had, well, and the audience's age, we've started to make references that are meaningful to us. We're not going to reference things that are meaningful to college students anymore. It's not saying we don't target college kids. It's college college kids still do read Morning Brew, but we're targeting a little bit older of an audience and the audience has aged up. In the early days of Morning Brew, we thought the newsletter was for college kids. And so it's a very different, uh, very different audience, a different way we speak to that audience now. Yeah. I, I know that you guys don't always necessarily like lean into this uh, comp, but I, I noticed that Barstool has started on Instagram to post like parenting videos. And, you know, I have a, I have a 14 month old. So like, I'm actually like, yeah, like, look at this, you know, crazy kid doing something. It's like, you can't even fathom them doing that seven years ago when it pertained, like, you know, it was like a frat party or something exclusively. So there, there mm-hmm. it makes sense that when it is so, it, a media business is so driven by its kind of core creatives that as those creatives all age, as time passes, there's going to be a similar kind of um, shift. But there's probably also a more, you know, uh, desirable target demo that your your advertisers like to reach. Exactly. Austin, this has been fantastic. I want to aim towards wrapping up. You've been an uh, excellent answer of all my questions. Um, before I do that, um, what's your take on why the Ravens have the ugliest uniforms in the NFL? Those black on black uniforms, those Monday night football uniforms with little purple, uh, accent. I don't know what you're talking about. I, we don't have that, that mustard yellow garbage in that horrible stadium up in Pittsburgh. I, uh, we're going to have to do like a, some sort of bet or something on the next time the, the Steelers are actually good. Cause this is definitely not the, uh, the, the, the Steelers year by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know. What's his name? Looks pretty solid though. What's his, what's your quarterback's name? The new we, guy? We like Pickett cause he went to Pitt, but he's there. There's a ceiling. We're not, we're not over the, the moon about him. I think that this is going to be a good, you really just have to worry about Burrow now for the next couple of years. Oh, they don't look very good either. Right. Yeah. You looked I, I good yesterday, but I don't know, man. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Um, this has been awesome. I want to make sure that people can connect with you in the digital world. Uh, what coordinates would you like us to point to people, uh, point people towards if they'd like to learn more about you, Morning Brew, all that good stuff? Yeah. I spend most of my time on Twitter. So it's Austin underscore Reef, R-I-E-F. You will find me. Beautiful. And we're going to also point people towards the new uh, healthcare newsletter that you guys have stood up amongst all the other amazing Morning Brew content linked at goingdeepwithaaron.com slash podcast or in the app where people are probably listening to this right now. Before I let you go, Austin, I would like to give you the mic one final time to issue a actionable personal challenge to the audience. So when I left college and started Morning Brew, our goal was to just like make money on the internet. And it's become very, a little cliche now. There are some people who talk about this, but if you haven't done it, just make a single dollar on the internet. I think it's a really empowering feeling to realize that, you know, we're in a time where a lot of people vilify technology and big tech companies, but if you can harness the power of the internet, learn on the internet and then sell things, whether it's you know, ads, whether it's product to people, I think it's such an empowering feeling to be able to leverage technology and leverage the internet to make money. Even if it's a dollar a week, you know, whether it's a side hustle or a full-time thing, I think it's really powerful. I think it's really empowering to understand that you can turn all of this stuff built for you, all this technology into a way to make money. I think it's really, really cool. So I'd encourage everyone to try to, in the next month, make a single dollar on the internet and grow from there. I could not agree more. I, I can remember exactly that the first time uh, I cre- created a transaction on the internet and uh, your life's never the same. So uh, love that challenge. Hope everyone will take it. And uh, Austin, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. We just went deep with Austin Reef. Hope you're not there. Has a fantastic day. Thanks for listening to the end of my interview with Austin. If you enjoyed it, you'll also enjoy my past conversation with the founder of The Hustle, Sam Parr, all about selling and landing seven-figure deals. Go check it out.